In December 2017, the country was shocked by the mysterious deaths of billionaire philanthropists Barry and Honey Sherman. The couple were found strangled in their Toronto home in what was first thought to be a murder-suicide, but eventually became a double homicide investigation. It's been nearly two years since their deaths, and we still don't have answers. Our next guest has been looking into what went wrong in the police investigation. Please welcome Chief investigative reporter for the Toronto Star and author of The Billionaire Murders, Kevin Donovan. Thank you. What a fascinating, uh, an absolutely fascinating read. Uh, let's begin with um, the details uh, here that I do want to let anybody know who's watching uh, that we will be discussing murder, and so some of the details may not be suitable for younger viewers, so please, if you do have young kids in the room, please be aware of that. Uh, okay, so Kevin, the Shermans, uh, we know they were multi-billionaires and, and one of the country's wealthiest couples. We don't know a lot about them, but you delve into that deeply into the mm -hmm. book, so tell us who they were and just how wealthy they were. Yeah, the, uh, Barry uh, was the founder of Apotex, a uh, generic uh, uh, pharmaceutical firm. Uh, his wife, Honey, a, a fellow philanthropist. Uh, they were, uh, by most accounts, very neat people. Uh, it's obviously sad that uh, what happened to them. They um, uh, touched a lot of people, uh, both through the major donations that we heard about, the multi-million dollar donations, but also a lot of uh, smaller uh, uh, stories along the way where they helped out, you know, the children of friends of theirs, for example. Uh, they were probably worth, uh, uh, on paper, uh, I've heard $5 billion, but I actually think it was a lot more because I think Barry had a lot of uh, 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 resources, let's say, that he had uh, uh, outside of Canada, and I think he was probably worth more than that. Uh, I've heard one person say up to $9 billion. Wow. wow. Okay. So on December 15th, uh, 2017, they were found dead in their home under rather mysterious circumstances. How were they found? Uh, well, they were found by a, a real estate agent uh, who was touring the house. The house was for sale. It had been for sale for only a couple of weeks. Uh, the agent came upon their bodies. Uh, they were found uh, in the basement swimming pool. This is about a 4,000 square foot house and uh, they were found uh, in a seated position with belts around their neck uh, held up against uh, the uh, uh, sort like of a, a, a metal yeah. railing that goes around the pool but the railing is only about a meter high uh, and so that's the way they were found they were uh, fully clothed uh, and uh, uh, Barry had uh, his, um, his glasses were perched neatly on his nose and one leg was crossed over the other. So news of the murder broke on a Friday and by Saturday morning, uh, the Toronto Sun is running a headline, murder-suicide suspected in deaths of Toronto billionaire and wife. So how did the murder-suicide come to be the initial theory and how damaging was that headline, do you think, to the, the case? Well, I mean, and, and the, it wasn't just the Toronto Sun, uh, the other media, including the Toronto Star, uh, uh, everybody covered well. yeah. this, this issue. Uh, they had initially thought, uh, reporters at the scene uh, heard that it was a, a double murder, and then sources were saying, no, that we're looking at this as a murder-suicide, that Barry killed Honey and then killed himself. Uh, it's hard to understand how uh, the initial uh, a police response came up with this. Uh, the, the first pathologist, uh, who was not as senior as the one the family eventually hired, he uh, seemed to miss some of the some of the key signs. And uh, all, the police at the crime scene uh, some, somehow got into their heads that this uh, could possibly be a murder suicide. When the situation I've just described seems like it's a, a, a murder, and ultimately what it was described as by the police six weeks later, a targeted double murder. Um, you mentioned the police there, and in the book you detail the list uh, of police negligence surrounding this case, things like missing getting fingerprints, missing getting DNA samples. What do you think happened there specifically with the police investigation in the earliest stages? Well, anybody who watches crime shows will know that it's the first 48 hours that yeah. is key in an investigation. Uh, and to be clear, the Toronto Police have not uh, felt comfortable in answering any of these questions, so it may turn out one day that, that they did an amazing investigation, but from uh, the people I've interviewed on, on the record and, and uh, on background, it seems like a lot of mistakes were made. Uh, for example, uh, you know, CCTV surveillance is everywhere these days. Uh, Apotex, the, uh, the place where Barry worked, uh, while his uh, while all the surveillance uh, footage was taken from that by police, they don't look at it for six weeks. Uh, the house across the street, this is a uh, house in a very wealthy area, but amazingly very few people have cameras. The house immediately across the street 
did have cameras. The family offered the footage to police. The police took two days to come, uh, literally walk across the street to seize the footage, uh, losing two days of footage because it's a, a seven-day wipe yeah. on these cameras. Uh, and then they, st they get that footage. They do not look at it for uh, six weeks. And then the other thing is that it was not until eight months later that people who had been with the Shermans, including a personal trainer that day, uh, a, a, a housekeeper, uh, they were with them the day that they were killed, and normally police would take the fingerprints and DNA to exclude, eliminate, yeah. eliminate those people. Uh, they were not uh, approached for that for eight months. Um, you know, what's fascinating about this is that um, at the same time that this investigation was happening, so too was the Bruce MacArthur serial killing investigation happening in Toronto. And you believe that the investigation surrounding um, his murders and his case also impacted then the Sherman case. How did you de determine that? Well, at the time, in December of 2017, uh, to all of us in the public, we were unaware that there was this MacArthur investigation. He was not arrested until the following year. But uh, when the media had um, police documents unsealed after Bruce MacArthur was uh, arrested, uh, we could see that it was exactly that couple of weeks when the Sherman investigation began that the Toronto police were very, very uh, involved in this MacArthur investigation. And so, uh, so my uh, early conclusion, preliminary conclusion, is that that took resources away from the Sherman probe. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now, the Sherman family believed that the, the police were messing up significantly. They believed this so much that they, in fact, hired their own lawyer, the top criminal, criminal lawyer in Canada, Brian Greenspan. They hired a team of private investigators, and they even ordered a, a second autopsy uh, to be done. What did this investigation reveal? Well, I think the most important thing that the private investigation did was hire Dr. David Chason, who was the uh, former uh, chief forensic pathologist for Ontario. And he did uh, a, a second set of autopsies and, and determined uh, that it was a double murder. That was really good that the private investigator, uh, private team did right. that. Since that time, it's unclear to me how helpful they've been. And I think they have sent to date 343 tips to the Toronto police, but uh, at least one of them includes a tip from a psychic. The, the Sherman family set up a reward line. They offered $10 million uh, to anybody who has information that would help in the investigation. And that has produced uh, a lot of information, which the private team is now sending to the police. And uh, my sense is that that is actually uh, the sort of uh, it's not that helpful to the police. The police are maybe not too pleased that all this information, which they might consider to be frivolous, right. they have, still have to check out. Right. Mm. So you wrote an article for the, for the Star highlighting findings from the private investigation. And once that article came out, the police then changed the story. Is that correct? Yeah, and it shouldn't happen that way. No. Uh, so uh, within a week, <laughs> within a... Although, you know, journalism does perform a a very important yes. role uh, in, in society. Uh, so what happened is uh, within about uh, four weeks of the, of the deaths, the Toronto Star published this story saying that the private team had concluded it was a double uh, homicide, but the police had no interest in what the private team was doing until it was on the front page of the Toronto Star. Uh, within uh, a day, uh, Dr. David Chason, the pathologist who did the second autopsies, he gets a call from the Toronto Police, comes in and provides his finding. He would have given them before if they'd asked. Yeah. And then within two days, there's a press conference at police headquarters, and they announce that they have, after six weeks, decided this is a targeted double homicide. Um, when you're dealing with the murder of billionaires, some people might easily assume this has to do with money and maybe that's who's behind this. And then you come to discover that the will situation is dubious at best for both Honey and, and, uh, and, and Barry. Um, where did their money go after this? Well, their uh, will, uh, Barry's will, Honey did not have a will, at least none that was ever found. Uh, the wills are subject to a seal. Uh, the Toronto Star is arguing to have this unsealed. Wills are not normally sealed in, in Canada. Uh, so we're arguing to get uh, access to these. Uh, as far as I know from people who have seen the will, uh, the money goes to the four children. There's uh, three daughters and one son. Uh, there's, there's no money put aside for charity, which is, was surprising to me because Barry and Honey were so philanthropic. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, and then there's some uh, uh, document which has been described to me that allows the trustees of the estate, I'll sometimes called the executors, to uh, give money to, uh, to other members of the family at their pleasure. Now, you've been working on uh, your book and writing articles for, for two years. You've been covering this case. And your conclusion is that Barry and Honey knew their killers. Why? Because I think somebody, they say that, a, that a, um, and apologies for saying this, but a strangulation, which is how they died, that is more, uh, that is a more of a personal attack uh, than somebody, say, being shot uh, from a distance. Uh, I also think that somebody had a sense of their, an intimate sense of that they would be home on that particular night and that the next day, the Thursday, if you recall the bodies were not found for 36 hours, that the next day they, there was really nothing pressing uh, that would cause people to, to really go and knock on that door. And I think that bought the killer or killer's time. Do you think this case will be solved? Well, uh, in a, a couple of weeks ago, I was interviewing, uh, having the opportunity to cross-examine the police detective on the case uh, as part of a court procedure we're doing, and I asked him that, that very question, and he said, cautiously optimistic. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, that's a cliffhanger if I've ever yeah. heard one. <laughs> Kevin, this has been an absolutely fascinating discussion with you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Wow. The Billionaire Murders is available now. Studio audience, you're very lucky you're going home with your copy today. We'll be right back, right after this.